his people. Look at verse 10. And again it is said, rejoice. Say rejoice. 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 Now there's a myth in evangelical, American evangelical Christianity that goes like this. God doesn't want us to be happy. He wants us to be joyful. Well, the word means be happy. I'm going to prove that to you. All right? When the Bible says rejoice as it does here, here's what that word means in Greek. The word rejoice means that you are so happy you throw a party over something. You are so happy you want to throw a party and invite all your friends. And I'm going to prove that to you. Flip over to Luke chapter 15. I want to show you exactly where this Greek word is used. Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells stories about three party throwers. Three people who are so happy about something they threw a party. And one is a shepherd. And the sheep gets lost and he goes out there and he finds it and brings it back. That's what he's just saying for us, right? He throws a party. He rejoices. He says in verse 6, and when, they were, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. There's a lady who's lost a coin. And she searches diligently until she finds it. Verse 15, verse 8. And she says, Rejoice with me, for I found the coin that I've lost. She calls her friends and neighbors and says, Come, rejoice with me. And there's a story of a, of a son, a man who had two sons, and the son said, Screw you, I don't want to be part of your life. I don't do what you tell me to do. I'd like to take my money and, and get going with my own life now. And he leaves his father. He pays for sex with money his father had given him. He wanders away, he winds up eating pig slop, and he wonders, well, you know, maybe if I go back, maybe at least my father will let me be a slave, maybe a servant in his house. And he goes back reeking of pig slop to his father. And his father rushes to him. He says, well, I'm not worthy to be called your son. I've, I've done all this. Hey, here's a, here's a robe. Go get a ring. That fattened calf, kill it. Because my son who was lost has come home. Now listen, here's the word I want to show you. Verse 23 says, And bring the fattened calf, the dad says, and kill it, and let us eat, and let us rejoice. That's the same Greek word. Let us celebrate. The word means to be happy enough to throw a party over something. All right? And here's how much they were happy. When the older son, even there's another son, when the older son is like hearing what's going on, as he drew his the house in verse 25, he came and he heard music. You know, my Church of Christ friends said, Amen. But <laughs> well, what else did he hear? And he heard, saw dancing. And all my Southern Baptist friends said, Amen. <laughs> they're celebrating, they're rejoicing, they're happy that God has done this thing. And now go back to Romans chapter 15. Paul says, I want you to have that kind of happiness. And then I want the Gentiles to have to enter into that happiness that you have. In the God who is happy you over people who come back to him. Friends, I don't know where you are or where your life has taken you. But if we take the story, what makes God happy? What makes our God happy? And Luke 15 tells us this, that our God is not just happy over those who get better for him. He is not just happy over those who get busy for him. But he is happy, celebrates those parties over those who simply come back to him. And from wherever you've been, whatever mistakes, whatever sins you indulge this week, you can come back to a God who will embrace you and love you and in your reek and in your smell. Because he loves you and his heart is that the unchurched would enter into the happiness his people. You know what that means for us? That means that our churches ought to be the happiest places in this town. <laughs> Sunday morning ought to be the happiest day in Sanger, Texas. Because those people are rejoicing in the God who loves them with a reckless love and delights in leaving 99 righteous to go pursue the lost one. And then he wants that happiness to be expounding overflowing in our churches so that those who are outside have something to enter into. So the Old Testament says, Rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. So first, God's heart for unchurched singers, that they would hear of him. Second, that they would be happy in him with his 
people. And then third, that they would worship Him. And here, Paul quotes Psalm 117, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles, and all the peoples extol Him. Uh, this is a, a fantastic um, psalm uh, from Psalm 117 uh, that Paul is, is quoting here. If you go to Israel today, um, and uh, if you know any Orthodox Jewish friends, and you say, hey, I want to learn a Hebrew song, uh, the very first Hebrew song they'll probably teach you is this one, uh, Psalm 17. Uh, Hallelujah, Adonai, uh, Kol Goim. Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. And they'll teach you that one because it's the easiest one to learn. It's the least amount of words, so you can pick it up. Um, but it also, it's a song uniquely among a set of psalms from Psalm 113 to 118 that specifically invite Gentiles to celebrate the salvation, the steadfast love, and the faithfulness of God. It's in a section of psalms called the Egyptian Hallel. And you know when Psalm 117 is sung by the Jewish people? It's sung at Passover. At Passover. Before Passover, as the meal the meal's getting ready to be set, they sing Psalm 113 and 114. Praise you, God, that you've rescued us from slavery in Egypt. Praise your name that you visited us in our suffering and you rescued us from bondage. Right? Psalm 113, 114. And then after the meal, when the blood is dripping from the doorposts of their house, they sing Psalm 117, and they say, Now, hallelujah, praise the Lord, Kogoim, all you Gentiles, for his steadfast love and his faithfulness. In other words, embedded for millennia into the Jewish culture is God's heart for Gentiles to experience the salvation that they experienced in Egypt. And they sing it every single year as they celebrate the slaughtered lamb that caused the angel of death to pass over them. And Paul is just drawing our attention here to the fact that embedded into our worship, our songs, our liturgy, if we have that, our sermons, our prayers on Sunday morning ought to be a heart that the Lord would let home church singer join us worshiping our God. For God's heart, for our church saying that they would heal him, that they would be happy in him, and then lastly, that they would find hope in him. Here's the thing, again, Isaiah says, not that Isaiah has spoken to other things, but again, the Old Testament says, this time through Isaiah, the root of Jesse will come, even he who arises to rule the Gentiles, in him the Gentiles hope. In the Gentiles hope. Do you know anybody that doesn't have hope? Why does a couple in Sanger just hang it all up and get a divorce? Why does the Sanger man spend his entire paycheck on alcohol and just drink himself into a sleeper? Why does, why does the Sanger woman just throw caution to the wind and have an affair? Why does the young lady go into a room and close the door and cut her wrists? Why do men and women waste themselves in pornography? I'll tell you why. Among many reasons, among the unique stories that each one of us have, men and women do this because their misery and their futility in life outweighs their hope. What is, what is hope? Hope is a confident expectation in my heart that something good will come. For those of us who know God, we have hope because we know that good will come. Right? We, we serve a, a Savior who conquered death and has promised to come away and wipe all tears from eyes, right? Take away all sickness and pain, all disease one day. We, we, we serve a, a God who faithfully sends the Son and the just and the unjust alike every single day. And he's promised to do, in the words of Sam Gandhi, to go Gandalf, one day he will make all that is sad come untrue. In our unchurched friends, neighbors, coworkers, in our community, who don't know Jesus Christ, have not heard of Jesus Christ, they're there. They do not have hope in God's heart for them, is that they would share the hope that you and I celebrate every Lord's Day, every Sunday morning, in song, prayer, Sunday. So here's God's heart for unchurched Sanger, that they would hear of him, that they would be happy in him, that they would worship him, that they would find hope in him. 
So my conclusion in response to God's word of the same day, let me ask you a question. Will you embrace God's heart for your neighbors, your schoolmates? To hear from that hope in him, to be happy with us in him. Will you delight when your church struggles to reach the unchurched and the church down the road is really good at it? Because you care more about God's kingdom expanding and reaching the lost than you do the success of your own local church. Will you celebrate and rejoice that God is moving through that church? And that those who haven't heard of him, don't know him, don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We'll hear of him, they will be happy in him, worship him, and find hope in him with us. Let me leave you with the benediction Paul gives here in Romans chapter 15. May the God of all hope fill you with all joy and peace and believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may go down. church to this morning, as a matter of fact, that talks about uh, remembering the blessings of God. I invite you to stand. This song is pretty easy to learn. Um, let's stand together and sing, We Will Remember.
my favorite verse. It's our testimony. I still remember. I still remember. Thank you. 